Would Mrs. Flores and Mrs. Walters please come to the council chambers for the Board of Referred Powers meeting, please? We need a quorum on this committee, don't we? Two of them, right?
Mr. Hernandez, Mrs. Picus, Ms. Galanter, Mr. Bernardi, Mr. Holden, would you, would you please come to the council chamber?
Uh, call the roll, please. Alatori, Bernardi, Brinson, Browdy, Flores, Galanter, Hernandez, Holden, Pikes, Ridley, Thomas, Wax, Walters, Wugar, Slosky, Ferraro. Ten council members present and a quorum, Mr. President. Yes, the uh, council will come to order. This is a meeting of the city council for the city of Los Angeles on the 28th day of April 1992. There are 15 council districts in the city. The regular meeting days are Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and we are currently being viewed by cable subscribers throughout the Los Angeles area on channel 35, and we're also being monitored by council phone. The first order of business. Approval of the minutes. All right, Mr. Holden moves. Uh, he was last in, so we'll let call his attention that he was last in. And Mr. Wu seconds. There's no objection. Unanimous vote. You get number one. Yeah, thank you. I, yeah, I just, uh, next item. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Yeah, if there's no objections, unanimous vote. Mr. Wu has an introduction. Thank you very much. Mr. President, members of the council, I'm honored today to present to the council the consul general from Japan, Mr. Kiyohiro Arafune. Many of you have known him over the course of the last two years and three months when he represented Japan here in the city of Los Angeles. This has been an exciting time, a stressful time, a time when uh, Japan has played an ever-increasing role, not only here locally in Los Angeles, but also around the world. And so it has been a most challenging assignment for Consul General Arafune. At the same time, I can say from my own personal experience, I have seen him participate in the life of the city, getting involved in many different activities, cultural, economic, and in many other ways, being an outstanding representative of Japan here in the United States. I remember one of the first times I saw you, Mr. Arafune, was at the County Art Museum, I think at the uh, Vincente Minnelli retrospective at the County Art Museum, which told me that you certainly had a great appreciation for American culture and would be an outstanding representative going both ways across the Pacific and from the Pacific to the United States. And so on the occasion of your departure from Los Angeles uh, and in recognition of your, your, uh, uh, your great contribution to the life of the city, uh, let me say on behalf of the entire city council, we, re we regret you, that you are leaving. We are grateful for all that you have done and we thank you very much for being a good friend to the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. President, at this moment, I'd like to present to you Council General Arifune, who would like to say a few words to the City Council. Well, thank you, Mr. Wu, Mr. President, and uh, distinguished members of the City Council. The, my, the period of my stay in Los Angeles um, has been uh, one of the most memorable, and I must say, honestly, the prime time years of my long diplomatic career. My family and I have enjoyed it tremendously, and am I, as I'm leaving, so many friends asked me, uh, where would you like to go? So I say, Los Angeles. And I'm so glad to see, I should have said at the outset, uh, the Mr. Ferraro, so good to see you back today. Has your councilman treated you well? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, I must admit that uh, the period of my stay here has been also uh, the, one of the toughest in view of the U.S.-Japan relationship. Uh, but um, the, I think friendship grows solid after going through hard time. And uh, the, I am per absolutely confident that um, the, our friendship will be solidly built up through, uh, for two reasons. One, I think the, my confidence in America during my stay here has been reinforced. The United States is fundamentally strong and healthy. Second, uh, perception-wise, uh, mutual perception has never been so bad in the recent years or decades, but our substance of our relationship has never been so good. Well, I can also say that I leave uh, with this conviction and also leaving behind me a small, uh, humble, but personal and visible 
uh, behind me in Los Angeles, that is Japan Calligraphy Center, uh, which has been my long-time dream. I'm very happy that that center has been inaugurated here, the first time in the world outside Japan. Well, they, I wish you good luck, and God bless you, and thank you very, very much again. Thank you very much, Mr. Arafune. We, we wish you well on your return to Japan. Yeah, we, thank you. we certainly want to wish you well, and thank you for the good service you've given to the city of Los Angeles. Good luck to you. Okay, okay the next item. Item one on today's regular agenda is a continued hearing, planning and land use management committee report, mitigated negative declaration resolution. This is a conditional use permit for construction of a church facility located in Council District 3. Uh, we have, this is a public hearing item, we have a uh, uh, Deb, Deb. Oh, were you notified that I was going to make some presentation? No, I didn't. I wasn't. Well, let's, let me, okay. okay, well, all right, we'll hold item number one for the time being. Uh, Mr. Uh, Holden. Uh, Mr. President, members of the City Council, I just want to add that the President and I had a unique experience to, shall we say, uh, uh, certify the district relationship with the 10th Consumatic District in Yangdong Po uh, during our last visit to Korea. Uh, we have the President of the of the District Council here, Mr. President, whom you, I'm sure, will recognize and remember. Uh, they are here to visit with us, and during this visit, uh, they're going to establish a relationship with the Wilshire uh, uh, Police de uh, uh, Department Division. And uh, they'll be visiting uh, with the, uh, uh, at the Academy. They'll be taking a, a flight to San Bernardino to look into that situation as well. So, uh, and they'll try and get a better basic understanding as how we have our police operations here in the city of Los Angeles. And we will learn from them and they will learn from us given the fact that we have a large Korean constituency here in my district and your district, Mr. President. The first person that we're going to recognize is a, a good friend of mine and yours, the Honorable Jin Wong Chung, President of the Young Dung Po District Council, City of Seoul. And let's give him a big hand. And the next person, Mr. President, is the Honorable Day Suk Kim, Councilman, Young uh, Dung Po District Council's City of Seoul. The next person is the Chief J. Yu Lee, Senior Superintendent, Seoul District Police Department. You got four stars. Deputy Chief Mi Yung Pak, Superintendent, Seoul District Police Department and Sergeant Yun Su Lee, Seoul District Police Department. I'm going to present them each a... Uh, a certificate of uh, welcoming them to the city of Los Angeles, Mr. President, and uh, so on behalf of the entire city council, I want to welcome you to the city of Los Angeles for you. And uh, Day Soup Kim. Right. Uh, you get him. And Jay Yuli. Okay. Right. Uh, and uh, me Yung Pak. 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 They gotta be there. Again, thank you for coming. I hope your visit is uh, informative and enjoyable. You want to say a few words? Uh, 따뜻한 환영에 감사를 드립니다. 앞으로 우리 양국에 더 우위가 발전되기를 기원하겠습니다. 고맙습니다. 
Mr. President, members of the council, thank you very much for your warm welcome, and I hope in the future we can uh, continue this long, uh, outstanding tra tradition of uh, mutual, mutually beneficial cultural exchange between Korea and the United States of America. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Holden, for bringing Mr. Holden. Thank you for bringing those very distinguished people in the council chamber. P appreciate it very. Mrs. Waller, do you have a presentation? Thank you, Mr. President. This is uh, National Victims' Rights Week, and we're here to make a presentation today to persons in the city attorney's office and elsewhere that have been working on the uh, uh, project for victims' rights. This is Mr. Vargas, and I'm pleased to present this uh, resolution to you, recognizing the work that uh, your group has done. It's signed by the mayor and all members of the council, and resolves that by the adoption of this resolution, the mayor and the council of the city commend the city attorney victim assistance program and in recognition of the importance of this program, hereby declare the week of April 26th through May 2nd as Victims' Rights Week throughout Los Angeles. Thank you. Okay. Members of the council, uh, thank you very much for being uh, supportive of us uh, this past year. Uh, I'd like to, at this point, introduce the staff of the Victims of Crime Program for the City Attorney's Office. If I could have my staff stand up, please. During the, the past year, this past year, the staff was actively involved with filing approximately 2,300 Victims of Crimes applications. With that came a, a, an amount of $5.8 million that was brought into the city of Los Angeles. This is all tax-free money. $5.8 million was brought into the, the city of Los Angeles for medical wage loss, funeral and burial expenses. Uh, the program assisted approximately 13,000 new victims last year. Unfortunately, the violence that is, is in our society now is increasing. I was just notified by a member of my staff that out of South Bureau homicide, there was 115 homicides from January 1 to date. Uh, and the, uh, citywide, there's been 21 children under the age of 13 that have been killed. Uh, and this is, is something that we are there to do in terms of assisting these survivors, the survivors of these homicide victims. Uh, I really wish to commend my staff for the hard work and the, the excellence that they have developed at the state level for the, the type of work that we do. So once again, thank you very much for your support, and we wish to have your support in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Walters. All right, the next order of business. Item one is a continued hearing, Planning and Land Use Management Committee report, mitigated negative declaration resolution on a conditional use permit in Council District 3. There's an amending motion distributed by Councilwoman Picus 1A. All right. Uh, we have uh, uh, Debbie Anderson who wants to be heard. Uh, Debbie Anderson. Uh, Debbie Anderson. Did you want to be heard? Um, yeah, all of the neighbors would like to be heard. Um, we've been heard before. I don't know that we're be really being heard now, but um, we are opposed to the church. Um, the Zoning Board of Administrators denied this church. Um, we have over 38 trees on that property that they want to take out, all, of, all but 12. We have um, a real problem with a preschool being right in front of our homes. Um, we have a problem with um, construction going on and, and the way the property's been kept up until now. Um, we have a problem with being threatened by these people as far as what's going to go in if the church isn't built. Um, I work at home a couple of days a week. 72 preschool children running around in front of my house is not real conducive to a working environment. Um, we all have a real problem with the trees, and the, the, these are, are pecan trees that are over 40 years old that they want to cut down. 
Um, we're all in opposition. We have uh, Tom, uh, Tom uh, Golovanovich. I know there's a vitch on the end. Okay, my name is Tom Sokolovich. I live at 8155 Ora Avenue. Uh, yes, I do oppose the church being built there. We have had different comments. The proposal was originally made that the church will be built and started within five years. Uh, Lee Ambers tells us that it's going to be started immediately. They talk of possibly of widening the street, which we oppose. They talk of, uh, first they tell us that the, the only two-story section will be the main church and not where the classrooms are, and now it's a two-story building. We are kind of left in the dark, and we're trying to find out what's really going on. So we would hope that the council would listen to the people who do live in the area and maybe try to find out all the facts of what is being proposed. Thank you. Or is there anyone else that wants to be heard? We, we don't have a card for you, but step up to the microphone and uh, give your name. And My name is Catherine Hilton. My mother and I live directly across in front of where this construction is going to be going. She is over 80 years old and has had a stroke. Uh, the house represents her life savings, and of course we are concerned about property values in the neighborhood. We are concerned with the environment, with the trees being removed. I have been to every meeting that has been held, and my opinion has been that very few people have listened to us, and I doubt that they're listening today, but I just want to stand up here and say that I oppose it. Thank you very much. Anyone else want to be heard? If not, the public hearing is closed. Mrs. Pikus. Uh, Mr. President and members of the council, uh, my staff has been working with the neighbors in the hope that we could reach an agreement that would be acceptable to them regarding the church. Uh, they still are not happy, but there is on, the, on your desk motion 1A, which includes uh, a number of additional conditions to the Plum Report that I hope will mitigate uh, the uh, negative impacts of the church as perceived by the by the neighbors and that will indeed improve their relationship. So although I wish that they were, that they felt better about this than they do, I nevertheless am going ahead with the uh, uh, motion 1A and I ask that you approve this amendment and then uh, approve the uh, matter before you, the recommendation of the Plum Committee. Anyone else want to be heard? Okay, we have 1A before us. Is there any discussion on that? If not, prepare the roll on 1A. Tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. That is approved. Now we have uh, one as amended. Prepare the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. That is approved. Next item. Item two is required hearing, Transportation Committee report amending the resolution that establishes a preferential parking district number 14 near the Greek Theater. Is there any, is that a public hearing item? Yes. Anybody want to be heard on that item? Anybody want to be heard? Seeing none, the public hearing is closed. Is there any discussion on this? If not, prepare the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. That is approved. Forthwith on that item. Next item. Item three is a continued hearing, protest street vacation portion of Bandera Street, southeasterly of Morrill Drive in Council District 11. Okay, we have item number three. Uh, we have Alan Netter that wants to be heard. Mr. President, I think we just need to hear the, uh, the uh, opponents on this matter. Well, there's... We only have the one card and he's in favor. Well, then I don't think the public hearing is necessary. Well, I know, but we, if he wants to be heard, he has to, we have to okay. let him. Okay. Apparently, he doesn't want out, does not want to be heard. Yes. Okay. Mr. Browdy? Well, uh, the committee report should be approved, uh, Mr. President. Okay. Mrs. Uh, Waller moves to uh, move the amendment and vacate. Is that the motion? Yes. Okay, you heard that motion. Is there any discussion? If not, prepare the roll. Tabulate the vote. Eleven ayes. That is it. 
That is approved. Next item. On today's continued agenda, item 61 is an ordinance first reading. Do you want to hold this until 12 members are present, Mr. President? Uh, yes. Next on the item. balance of the regular agenda, items four and five are also 12 vote items. Item six is a human resources and labor relations committee report and an ordinance is on the file. Are there any specials there, four, five, or six? Any specials? Are we expecting 12 today? Yes, Mr. President, you might want to hold four and five on the desk. Four and five will hold on the desk. Uh, six has a committee report, the ordinance you can hold. Okay, well, Put, let's vote on the committee report. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Okay, we'll leave the ordinance on the desk. Next item. Item 7 is continued planning and land use management committee report, categorical exemption, ordinance is on the file. Item 7 is called special. Next item. Item 8 is Continued Planning and Land Use Management Committee Report, General Exemption, Ordinance on the File. Uh, item number 8, is there any discussion on item number 8? Seeing none, uh, prepare the roll on item number 8. Committee report only. Committee report. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. We'll hold the ordinance, hoping that we get a 12 votes. Next item. Items 9 through 13 are committee reports. 9 through 13. Any specials there? Thank you, dear. Uh, there's uh, no one wants to be heard on item through 9 through 13, so prepare the roll. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Those are approved. Next item. Item 14 is a report from the Transportation, Budget and Finance, Human Resources and Labor Relations Committees. Item 14, any discussion on that item? 14. Seeing none, the pub, uh, prepare the roll, tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. And that is approved, next item. Item 15 is communication from the Chairperson Planning and Land Use Management Committee. Motion required, 10 votes to consider. Uh, any objections to considering that item? And seeing none, the matter is before us. We do have a, uh, Don Sch Schultz wants to be heard on this item. Don Schultz. Are you are you in favor of this, Mr. Schultz? Uh, no, I'm not, Mr. President. Well, okay. Welcome thank back, Mr. President. Hope you're feeling well. You look great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak before you regarding this proposed zone change in Van Nuys. Our organization has written all 15 council members about this project, claiming that we were denied due process at the February 25th Plum Committee meeting at which time Attorney Ben Resnick spoke and spoke and spoke. While two Mr. officers Mr. of our... Schultz, well, just on seven, on, it's been called special. Seven. No, 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 this is 15, Mr. Bernardi. I know, but he's speaking, the comments he's making apply to seven. I think he wants yeah. to be heard on. He's talking about Catherine and Sherman Way. I'm sorry. I thought we were talking about number seven. I'm sorry, Mr. Bernardi. You, uh, you marked number 15. Did you want to be heard on 15? Yes, sir, I did. Okay, yes, sir. Just, we're on 15 now. Uh, on, num on number 15, Mr. President, uh, my name is Don Schultz, and I chair the San Fernando Valley Alcohol Policy Coalition, their planning committee. This is a project that we have uh, fought because of the liquor license and the proximity to residential. We are asking that you deny the appeal of the applicant and go along with the recommendations that were made by the zoning administrator and that were upheld also by Plum and the BZA. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Is there anybody else who wants to be heard on item 15? Seeing none, the public hearing is closed. We need a motion on this, Mr. Burnson. Mr. Burnson moves the Plum Committee and it's been seconded by Mr. Browdy, I believe. Any discussion? Prepare the roll. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. 
That is approved. Next item. Item 16 is continued communication from the Chairperson Community and Economic Development Committee. It's been submitted without recommendation. A motion will be required from the floor, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, the Chair of the Committee asks if we could hold that on the table till he arrives. Item yes. 16. Okay, we'll call that special. Next item. Item 17 through 26, Rule 16, motions and resolution. Ten votes to consider. Any objections to considering those items? Seeing none, the matters are before us. Any uh, Mr. President, the Department of Transportation has suggested that we receive and file item 21. It is no longer needed, so I so move. Okay, then you don't object to consideration. No, I don't object to consideration. Okay. Anybody want to be heard on any of those items? Seeing none, uh, the public hearing is closed. 21 is requested to be received and filed. Are there any other specials? If not, prepare the roll on 17 through 26, with the exception of 21, which has been received and filed. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Those are approved. Next item. On today's supplemental agenda, item 27 is an Arts, Health, and Humanities Committee report and an ordinance on the El Pueblo. Yeah, Mr. Hernandez. Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Alatori, the councilman of the district, has requested that we continue that item for one week. Are there any objections to continuing that item one week? Seeing none, the matter is uh, continued. Next item. Items 28 through 30 are committee reports. There's been a request by Council District 9 to continue item 29 for one day. There's no objection. 29 will be continued one day. That'll be the order. Okay, we have 28 and 30. 30 is call special. We have uh, 28. Prepare the roll on 28. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That's approved. 29 was was uh, continued one day. Continued one day, and 30 is uh, is call special. Next item. Item 31 is continued intergovernmental relations committee report. Item 31. Any discussion on that? If not, prepare the roll. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. The amendment? The issue here, Mr. 31A is being distributed, Mr. President, by Councilman Bernardi. No, uh, the, the issue here is whether the CRA funds uh, call it special. Yeah, we'll reconsider that and call it special. Which? 31. 31. 31. Okay, that's call special. Okay, the next item. Items 32 through 35 are communications from the Chairperson Community and Economic Development Committee. Motion required, 10 votes to consider. Is there any objection to considering those items? Seeing none, the matters are before us. Uh, we, have, we have somebody that wants to be heard on 34. We'll call that special. Are any, anybody else? 36 also, we have somebody that wants to be heard. And 40. So we have 32 through 35 are the first batch. Oh, 32 through 35. Uh, well, we do have 34 that wants to be heard. Call that special. Any other specials? 32 through 35. 32, 33, 35. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Those are approved. Next item. Items 36 through 40 are communications from the Chairperson Intergovernmental Relations Committee. Motion required, 10 votes to consider. Any objections to considering those items? Seeing none, the matters are before us. We have people who want to be heard on 34 and... and uh, Mr. I mean President, can I ask reconsideration of 35? I need to know about um, ADEPT. And if, if I could ask for um, reconsideration of item 35 and then um, call it special. If there's no objections, we'll uh, reconsider 35. Seeing none, that'll be the order. Okay, on uh, 36 through 40, we have uh, somebody wants to be heard on 36. We have somebody wants to be heard on 40. Any, are there any other, any, anybody want to be heard on any of the other ones? Seeing none, the public hearing are closed on those. Mr. Bernardi? Did Arsh will come up here and explain uh, the status of these particular bills. Is this item 36? Item 36. Yeah. That has to, deals with rent control. 
Well, if we're going to talk about 36, we have to have a public hearing. Well, that's fine. I we'll, he ought to explain we'll, call, we'll call it special. Okay. Mr. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, no one wants to be heard on those other ones, so let's pray 37, 38, and 39, prepare the roll, tabulate the vote. 11 aye. Those are approved. Mr. Wu, did you? Uh, For an introduction, Mr. President. Uh, members of the council, I'd like to introduce to you a distinguished visitor here in the council chamber. We are honored with the presence of the deputy mayor of Guangzhou in China, Mr. Xi An Hai. Mr. Xi An Hai, thank you very much. Welcome to the council chamber. Thank you, Mr. Wu. All right, uh, next item. Item 41 is communication from the Chairperson Community and Economic Development Committee. It's submitted without a recommendation. Ten votes to consider, and there's 41A on the desk. All right. Is there any objections to considering 41? Yes, at this moment. I'd like it continued uh, until Councilman Mark Ridley Thomas arrives, please. Held on the desk until he well, arrives. Okay, well, well, you don't object to it being on the considered then? We'll no, do, I don't object to okay. it, be, it There's being no objection considered, to that. but There's, just to be held until yeah. he arrives. We'll, we'll call it special. Anybody want to be heard on 41? Seeing none, the public hearing is closed. Mr. Hernandez? I, I know we're considering the item, Mr. President, but also uh, Councilman Alatori, who's part of the committee, asked if this item could be continued one week for when he'd be present. Item 41? Item 41. Right. We have an amending motion. Uh, by who? Mr. Burnson? Yes, by yes. Councilman Burnson's on the desk. Okay, well, we'll uh, continue that as well. Is there no objections to that? Well, I don't know. There's, there may be a problem as far as the uh, as far as the amendment is concerned because one of this the 41A reinstates an agency that was uh, deleted, but now qualifies to be reinstated, and uh, I just wonder if there's a problem on that. Is there a problem on that to continue this one week? We have a request to continue this order, one week. Mr. President. I think there seems to be discussion and question about this item. I, you called it special. I think that's the way it ought to remain. Yeah, can we hold it on the desk until Mr. Uh, Gridley Thomas gets here? He is expected today, is he? Okay, yes. fine. Okay, 41 will be uh, call special. Next item. Mr. President, I no longer have questions on 35. Okay, let's uh, prepare the roll on 35. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. Next item. Items 42 through 48 are Rule 16 motions, 10 votes to consider. Any objections to considering those items? Can we just make that receive and file, being that those hearings will be held here? Which okay. one? 47. Okay, well, let's, uh, there's no, no objection to consider. Anybody want to be heard in any of those items? Seeing none, the public hearing is closed. 47, you want to receive and receive file? Receive and file, be that the hearings there, will be held in this room. If there's no objections, that'll be the order on 47. Any uh, other specials? If 42 through 48. If not, prepare the roll on those items with the exception of 47, which has already been acted on. Tabulate the vote. 11 aye. Uh, those are approved. Next item. Forthwith on 43. That'll be the order. Next item. Items uh, 49 and 50 are closed session matters, Mr. President. Are these uh, public hearing items? No. Okay. The Forty-nine and fifty are called special and live for the executive session. Next item. The next item. Item 16 was special holding for Ridley Thomas. He hasn't arrived yet. Item uh, 30 was called special by Councilwoman Flores. Uh, Mrs. Flores, item 30, what about seven? Um, oh, Mr. President, this is the uh, welfare reform issue that's going to possibly be on the ballot in November, and I wanted to call it special in order that I can vote against it. Now, item number 30. Welfare, Anyone else want to be heard? Not prepare the roll on item number 30. Tabulate the vote. Nine eyes, two no. Uh, 
that is approved. Next item. Item 31 was called special. No, that's good. No. Okay. Uh, 31. Who called 31 special? I, I called Mr. it Mr. Bernardi? Yes. Um, there is um, basically the committee is pretty much in agreement with the report, but where the disagreement comes in is two of the members are in favor of the CRA tax increment money being used citywide wherever they're needed, while the, um, Rita Walters is opposed. Um, she supports only being used in the redevelopment areas where the funds will come from. And the uh, president and the council and I are in favor of using these funds, funds citywide. So that's, that's the, uh, 31A is the um, uh, amends the uh, committee report before us and just makes that one substantive change. Mr. Wu, did you want to be heard on the... Uh, I thought maybe the chairman of the uh, finance committee would be here because this is... He's not going to be here today. This is quite a discussion involving yesterday. All right. Mr. Wu? Yes. Mr. President, uh, this, this, this item which went through the IGR committee was based on my motion that goes back a number of weeks. It was an effort to try to make redevelopment funds available for police. The idea was, uh, when I first introduced the motion, was to remove the obstacles in state law to allow redevelopment money generated in a particular project area to be spent within that project area. Since then, it's become a much larger issue in the overall budget. Uh, I don't think it's productive for us to get into that debate today. Uh, I would support the first part of Mr. Bernardi's motion, uh, but I can't support the second part of the motion. And so I would ask for a division of the question. And personally, I will vote for supporting the state legislation that will bring up the subject and which would enable redevelopment monies to be spent on, on police. But um, uh, I want to vote no on the second paragraph uh, under the motion. So uh, I'll ask for a division of the question, Mr. President. Hernandez. Yeah, Mr. President, I also rise to support the division of the question. I think uh, we as a city are dealing with a lot of issues. And uh, for some reason, when we do things citywide, it affects uh, those low-income communities, those overpopulated communities at a much higher rate. I think the compromise that Mr. Wu is proposing at this time is something we should consider. Uh, if uh, that, that wasn't the case, uh, we wouldn't be able to use those tax increments being generated from those zones to try and redevelop those communities. And I'm asking again that we seriously uh, don't consider using these funds citywide at this time, but at the same time I'm supporting Mr. Wu's amendment or his, his motion to separate the question so that we can deal with the legislation first and then debate the item. Yeah, there, there's no objections to uh, divide the question. Mr. Bernardi? Mr. Bernton, did you want to be heard? Is there, what is being divided here? Uh, the, the amended motion by oh. Councilman Bernardi. Oh, there's an amended motion here. All that would do is you either vote yes or no on using the funds, CRA funds, citywide. Okay, Mr. Uh, Holden. Uh, Mr. Wu, why are you against the second part of Mr. Bernardi's motion? Uh, the reason was originally when I introduced the motion asking the city to take a position on this issue, the reason for that was to make redevelopment money generated in a particular project area available to pay for police services within that particular project area. Since I introduced that motion, it's become much more part of a larger citywide issue relating to the budget. I don't support spending uh, redevelopment money for areas outside of a redevelopment area. So that's the reason why personally I can't support it. I do support the idea of taking a position and supporting the but bill. You, you will support using the CRA money where you can identify a linkage between the problem generated by C the redevelopment area uh, and right. Okay, that's right. and, the, and, and the CRA and the problem and the CRA. That's right. You support that. Yes. Well, but you know, you can't be specific and identifying a crime and drugs as it relates to whether or not it's been created or generated in part or in whole by a redevelopment area. You cannot, not really, and not unless you get 
some guy come up and says, I did it and it was done in that area and I left that area and went into this area and that's where I was apprehended. So I think that uh, what they're providing with part two of this motion is leaving it to be a local option where we can decide if we choose to do so, how much money we want to spend and the areas in which we want to spend it. And in as much as we're amending the legislation at this time to give us the authority, I would suggest you give us the, all of the authority so we don't have to go back to the legislature in the future and say we can decide how the money is to be spent. I would say that you should ask for the authority to spend the money, let it be a local option, and we can decide on local level what part or if it's in part or in whole, if a crime is committed, whether or not it's associated with a redevelopment area or project. And so I don't see, I think this is a kind of a motherhood amendment, to be very honest with you, a manhood too. <laughs> so I'm going to support Mr. Bernardi. It doesn't do any, it doesn't hurt us because we can always say no when it comes down to Am I right, Mr. Wu? We can always say no. It's a local option. So hey. I don't see any real problem. <laughs> Mr. Bernson. Yeah, I, uh, I have no problem with either one of these uh, amendments uh, that Mr. Bernardi's proposed. I would like to uh, point out that as long as uh, Senator Roberti has a legislation right. that uh, is making amendments to the redevelopment laws, uh, that there is another matter that may seem trivial, but this may be the time to do it. And that relates to housing. Uh, under the current law, 20% of all increment funds must be uh, allocated for uh, for housing or housing replacement, and it may not, it may, it does not necessarily have to be in the district. It can be uh, contingent to the district. Uh, in some areas of the state, in fact, we have a local issue that took that's taking place right now, uh, where the city of Culver City uh, has to uh, replace. Uh, they, they are very uh, job rich and uh, housing poor as far as the number amount of housing, and they are going to, as part of a major project that's now. Uh, uh, going to be before, uh, was just before SCAG yesterday, they're going to have to develop some housing. Uh, one of the boundaries of the property falls into the city of Los Angeles, and it may be the most opportune place for the housing replacement to take place, or the housing placement to take place. But because of state law that says it must be within the city boundaries of that city, uh, that could not be located in that area. So perhaps, uh, Mr. Wu, I know that you are in communication with the senator, Perhaps you might want to suggest that uh, such an amendment, which would, uh, in areas where there is a uh, imbalance of jobs housing ratio, that the housing may be located outside the boundaries of the uh, city uh, where the redevelopment uh, area takes place, as long as it's within a radius of five miles, which satisfies the jobs housing ratio uh, ideal traveling area. So I think as long as we're on the basis of this, you might want to. Uh, uh, also point that out to him, and I'd like to amend that and make this part of this motion. Is there a second, Mr. President? Is there a second to Mr. Thirty-one. Okay, Mr. Browdy, you have the you have the floor. Oh, with regard to 31A, uh, uh, Councilman Bernardi's uh, motion, uh, I always support giving the council uh, options to uh, increase its range of alternatives that it can make. And we can determine the policy here, and I think that's where the policy should be made, and that is uh, in this council. So I'm going to support Councilman Bernardi's uh, amendment, and I happy to see that uh, Councilman Holden also agrees with that uh, position. Mrs. Flores. Mike, do I understand your, Mike, Mr. Wu, do I understand your uh, amendment, although it's not very clear on here, to, to mean that the funds would have to be expended in the area of the CRA where the re project is and that it would be in addition to the regular police department services? Uh, let me try to answer your question. The, my original motion was to authorize it, was to call for a change in state redevelopment law allowing redevelopment 
tax increment dollars to be spent on police services within redevelopment areas. And the idea was it would be in addition to, would not supplant, would not replace, in fact, my, maybe Mr. Deaton could say some more about this. My understanding is that we are not currently allowed to replace regular general fund monies with re redevelopment tax increment monies. Uh, well, I, I don't want him answering your thing on okay. my time, but my problem with this is that yesterday I read in the paper that we're talking about taking some $60 million from the Community re Redevelopment Agency to police to, to help us make sure that we don't lose police officers in the city. And I'm not so sure that I want to have some of the projects that are very important to my constituents cut out and still, and, and then someone else will get more police services than we're getting citywide. I'm losing on both counts then I think. I'm losing the police and I'm losing the projects. So I believe that this whole matter should come in at the time of the budget and I so move. You, you want to continue the matter until uh, it's, it's before the budget? It, when is this going to be up? Okay. Is this legislation, Ron? It's scheduled tomorrow. Oh. Is there, right, so. a way, is there a way that we can say it so that we have the option of, uh, the council will have the option if, if this is approved of either doing it in the redevelopment district or throughout the city, is there a way of wording it so that it would be at the option of the I think that's council? the thrust of Mr. Bernardi's motion. The difficulty is that what, for example, what the finance committee did yesterday as their recommendation to the council was not to use redevelopment agency monies for police services. What they stated, what the, the recommendation is, is that there are some projects within the district, within the project area, that are currently being, you, being financed with general fund monies that we believe can be uh, well, supported by CRA money. Well, let's face facts, Ron. The, 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 the committee may very well say that the money isn't going for more police, but the reason that they want to put it to other projects is so the money for those projects can be cleared up to, to do police. I mean, what, what... The ultimate impact is there's less money in the CRA project area and there's and, more, and money. more money on the other side. But the fact is, as opposed to what Mr. Bernardi's motion would be, which is that the, the council could make the decision to use project money citywide for police purposes, which I do not believe will do very well in Sacramento. If you do, if you do that, why do you have a, a project area anyway? Well, if you use it for city, if you if you use it, a, a pro, if you use CRA money for any citywide project, then what's the purpose of having a CRA in in communities? In some instances, the for example, some of the Bunker Hill money is being used for citywide housing or citywide childcare. That's child because care. they're being replaced Our in those areas. Miss Galanter. <clears throat> I'm going to need some clarification on how many motions we've got on the floor and what they all say. But I, the, it seems to me that there are several separate considerations here, and I think they ought to stay separate. Um, Mr. Bernson, for example, uh, threw an amendment onto something, and I'm not clear what it amended, that <clears throat> we ask that the legislation be amended to allow housing to be in a separate community from the jobs. Frankly, the city of Los Angeles is the housing community for the commercial projects in a number of other cities, including Culver City. And the, the reason for that is that every city wants to have the commercial property. I don't think the commercial property or the housing is the issue with this particular bill. And as I understand it, um, this simply has to do with whether you can use money in a re from a, re a redevelopment agency in a redevelopment area for something else. So can, can you help me, Mr. Deaton? Basically. What, all, what are the motions we've got on okay. the table? And what, thank you. Okay. And what is this bill? Well, we still have several on the table. My understanding of the bill is that, the, the, that it allows for uh, the use of funds for police services within the district in order to uh, accomplish problems within the district. Mr. Bernardi's motion extends that, to that, that monies that are de derived from the district can be used for police services citywide. My point is that um, if you have a redevelopment agency, 
The purpose of that is to address the problems within right. the district. There are some citywide fund, some citywide mon excuse me, some money that are contained from the district that are used for, used for citywide purposes, such as housing. Right. But they are in order to, uh, if, if for example, to alleviate problems that you've created as a result of, uh, of things you've done in the district, i.e., childcare, i.e., housing. If you do not want, if you want to use the increment, the property tax, for services such as police and fire citywide, then you shouldn't have the redevelopment agency. That's right. That's the, why the, the, the whole purpose of a tax increment is, is to funnel it into one okay. particular area. The, so maybe so we shouldn't have there a redevelopment is a, agency. That's, that clearly is the local, okay, I think from a public policy point of view, that is the local option. Which the is whole, whether to have the whether agency or not. Whether or not to have not. a CRA and how long it should be going on. and, and caps and all kinds of other issues that derive itself that derive from this fundamental decision to have a redevelopment agency but I do not believe that in Sacramento there is going to be a, a, a belief on the on part of the legislature and the governor that we should create an agency get tax increment in essence from schools and counties etc in order to correct blight and then in, in that process use those funds for citywide services such as police and fire. Well, This is not the same as what the Finance Committee recommended yesterday. It ultimate no, no, impact I, 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 been, I understand a, what the Finance Committee There's a, a cap on this. You're on my time. Hold on. He just you're, used you're, up all my your time. Your time is up. Yeah, I know. Can I just finish up on yes. the part he used? Yes. Um, it, it does seem to me that what we're talking about here is the fundamental question of whether to have a redevelopment agency or not. And I suspect that this isn't the best moment or the best forum to discuss that very fundamental issue. Uh, Mrs. Walters? Well, I would agree with uh, Ms. Galanter on that last statement. As I understood uh, Mr. Wu's request, it was to separate uh, the last two paragraphs and vote on them separately uh, for the express purpose of avoiding the discussion at this moment on whether or not there's to be uh, an agency. I would. Uh, move the uh, uh, third paragraph of the, of, uh, the document of Mr. Bernardi's motion uh, and simply state that uh, the IGR committee report uh, support, uh, be in support of the Roberti and Friedman legislation and so that compromises can be worked out uh, in Sacramento and leave the last paragraph of discussion for a later time. All right, uh, Mr. Bernardi, for a second time. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't, I, it's hard. I can't believe what I'm hearing here from the legislative analysts. I don't know. Do you have a blue card here to act as a lobbyist? You have a, what, what, what do you have? Do you have a, a, a golden insight with respect to what the legislature would do? Where do you think that money comes from? Whose money is that that's created in the, in, um, in the redevelopment areas. And Mr. Hernandez, there are a lot of areas not Encino, not Woodland Hills, not up, up in the Santa Monica Mountains in these areas. They're in my area, in Pacoima, in North Hollywood, where there are low-income people in your district and many other districts. And what this would do was allow the police department to have the flexibility, use that money where they think the impact is the greatest and that's what this is what this is asking for and maybe i think that the the change that the finance committee made yesterday is in an entirely different direction originally it was talking about using that money for police protection but now it's using that money it's taking money general fund money no one complained around here except me about all that general fund money that should have been used out in the city for police protection being used by the redevelopment agency and relieving it of its obligation that it has in the redevelopment project. But the Finance Committee, I think, is on the right track when it's going to require that the redevelopment agency use its own money in the districts for the kind of program, whether it's a convention center, whether it's a library, or whether it's a narco towers, and narco towers, incidentally, was stripped away from the CRA, but for high-rise buildings. And so all this would do would give the police department the flexibility to use it otherwise. You didn't, all of you got up here and really pleaded when the argument came in about using redevelopment funds for what?
for that child care program after school? All of you stood up on your haunches and you screamed. And I said that that was the Board of Education's responsibility, but none of you got up to say, no, we're going to use redevelopment funds out in Woodland Hills, out in Pacoima, which is fine, out in Venice and the other areas. That was factual. That was all right. But now when you have a real critical area and, and, and where we badly need the money, and the CRAs, in particular, some of them are nothing more than a leech on the backs of the taxpayers, particularly in the city of Los Angeles. So go ahead. I think that what ought to be done is you continue, turn this matter, discuss this matter when it comes up with the budget, when that other proposal comes up, because you're going to be accomplishing the same thing when the general, when the fund, general funds are no longer permitted to be used in the library and the convention then come into the general fund. It's there to see that Mr. there is no cut in the police department. So you're going to be accomplishing the same thing. Thank you. So thank I you. think you ought to stand up. You know what you're talking about when you stand up, and I don't think you thank do. You, thank you, Mr. Bernard. And Mr. Hernandez. Yes, uh, Mr. President, members of the council, I can appreciate what Mr. Bernardi just finished saying. And Mr. Bernardi, you do have areas in your district that are blighted. Uh, there's a chart here, basically, that I thought I'd hand out for everybody to see so that we'd realize what's really been going on. One of my fears is the citywide decisions, because uh, as a lot of people have stated, we are one city. My real problem is that we don't all have equal access to parks. We don't all have equal out access to affordable, decent housing. We don't have equal access to transportation. And the reason I thought I'd prepare these charts is so that we could see it in black and white. Something tells me that those council members who are going to be pushing for citywide funding are not the areas that have the blight, are not the areas that have to depend on the CRA funding to try and make a difference in people's lives. Right now, in this district that I represent, I have a clear understanding of what my obstacles are. Four council districts in this city have over half the blight. It'd be different if it was citywide and if people could live citywide. It'd be different if our parks were equal. It'd be different if we didn't have schools that were closed in some parts of the district for lack of population and schools that were basically with 2,000 elementary school students attending them. Your crime statistics verify those same kinds of things, Mr. President. I think when Mr. Wu was making his motion and proposing what he was proposing, it was so that we could try and equalize things throughout this city, so that we could try and make a difference in people's lives throughout this city. What I really fear is when you look at the charts and you look at the votes and you look at the areas that are being represented, how those decisions are made. Because this city and the differences between people have been created. People were not born this way. And so I'm asking members right now to seriously consider that decision. I honestly believe that we need those funds to help those people who don't have the equal resources the rest of the city has. I thought I'd put it in black and white. You also have the same situation with parks. It's another motion we introduced completely separately. I did not expect to start debating this issue at this time. But CRA is one of the few ways we can try and overcome some of the obstacles facing people in this city. And I would again ask us to support Mr. Wu's actions. Thank you. All right. Members of the council, first of all, we have some visitors from Ingleside Hospital from uh, Rosemead. Uh, they're in the audience. Would they please stand? We want to welcome you. There they are back there. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Hope you enjoy your visit. Uh, members of the council, if there's, no, if there's no objections, I'm going to ask that we have public comment at this time. We have some people that want to be heard, and uh, they've been very patient, and uh, they have other things they want to do. So if there's no objection, we'll allow the public 10-minute public hearing now at this time. And uh, we'll, uh, I don't know if these are the right order, Mr. T. Rogers. Okay, here we go. I am um, I'm the executive vice president of the American program. I also, I'm also the national spokesman for the Mayor I Can program that has been sponsored by Jim Brown. What you see before you is first and foremost peace and unity and a coming together of the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles, Crips and Bloods. 
Well, that's funny. They said that it couldn't be done. While we're standing here before you with our daughters, with our sons, with our children, our brothers, we're not selling dope. We're not killing nobody. We're not, we're not going back to jail. Recidivism is, is, is not a part of our lifestyle. It's not a part of our, our mentality anymore. And as I stated, I'm a father to my children and I love them madly. I was once voted in as, the, as one of the 10 most wanted gang leaders in South Central Los Angeles. That was some time back. Huh, that's funny, now I got voted in as an, as an executive vice president. If I had to set up, if I set up a platform of death 20 years ago, then, then truly I can build a pyramid of peace now. We have been called the problem, and as we stand before you, we are definitely the solution. There are no experts on gangs. The creature does not exist. Each one of us as individuals make up the totality of a gang, and each one of us are experts on our own lives. And we're definitely the controllers, the rulers, and the experts on our communities. We understand politics, we understand the economics, and we also understand that gangs are big business. See, no more hanging, banging, and slanging for us. We are the new executive vice presidents, we are the new CEOs, we are the new executive board, we are the new directors, we are the new management, we are the new corporate America. We are your new leadership. If we can run street gangs, truly we can control a corporate board. We're not selling dope. When we're not the ones that are doing the killings, we're not going back to jail. And we care and we love for our babies. Charles Harms. Yes, that's me. It's Charles Harris. I'm sorry. <laughs> Charles Harris. I would like to state the problem first. We, the children of the disenfranchised communities, declares that the socioeconomic conditionings of our inner city black, white, Hispanic, and Korean communities will dismay are not irreversible. And the very nature of those communities detect a very negative mode of behavior, which is visibly manifested in the spoiling high school dropout rates, the degree of chronic unemployment, the escalated and drug-related and gang-related activities, and the exceptional of increase of incarceration and numerous other factors. I feel the American program is, in many ways, a missing link, empowering those exempt from power and participation in the mainstream. Yeah. We feel, we feel and believe in and work effectively with those whose society disregard, contending that it is never too late to attain a full, meaningful life. We in the Mayor I Can program are willing and capable of working with and enhancing any individual or organization that is motivated to affect positive change. And that's what we're about. Uh, Aqua, Cheryl. Aqua, Cheryl. Akila. My name is Akila Sherrells. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And I guess to add on to a little bit, or what, um, or what I call him is Chop, what Chop just stated is that drug abuse is not a problem, it's only a symptom of the problem. Gang violence, high school dropout rate, alcoholism, none of these things are problems. They're only symptoms of the problem. And the true problem is in the mind of that individual. And many of the individuals that are suffering from these problems were born into conditions and situations that they really have no control over. So what we believe in the Mayor I Can program is empowering an individual to take the responsibility for his own self-determination. But we don't omit that a person must have his primary, his secondary, and his social needs met. The same thing that everybody in this room needs in order to survive every day is the same thing that these individuals need. We're tired of being categorized within the same category as animals. I mean, a crip, a blood, a pig, a dog. We're human beings. We have feelings, we have emotions, 
We have aspirations, we have dreams, just like everybody else. And we demand, or rather no, we command that we be given the same respect from you and from everybody else. Like T. Rogers stated earlier, can't nobody stop the gang situation but the gang members themselves. And once we decide to change that, then it's gonna change. But at the same time, we don't feel that they should be sending so-called gang psychologists, these, you know, no disrespect to the older people in the community, but they have really no control over us. You have to empower the individuals who have the control in the community. A snipe, a high T, a chop, a dao. You have to empower those individuals who can get the youngsters in the community. It ain't no writing off our generation to get the kids because the kids already look up to us and respect us. They see us every day. So they ain't gonna listen to you because they've been thoroughly trained in manipulation skills. So they're gonna get everything that they want out of you and then they're gonna discard you. But they'll listen to us and they're gonna respect us. So you empower us, or rather we empower ourselves, then the kids follow us on the right direction and um, going towards the right path. Thank you. Twilight Bay. Yes, my name is Twilight Bay, and I'm here today representing my community, which is known as Circle City Par Rules, known to you as the Parkside Manor in Watts. And my concern is this, is that millions and millions of my community tax dollars are going to programs that do not work in my community. And I want to know why can't those dollars be given to programs that we, the community, endorse and we, the community, say work? And I also would like to know, why is it that we are not given a fair chance and a fair shake at getting an opportunity to get those funds that are allowed to be used for community-based organizations? And I'd like to say this also, that the American program has taught me how to properly deal with problems. I have eliminated the negative, established the facts, and chosen my best option. And I've come to you with my hands open, asking why do you deny me? Uh, Dwayne Holmes. That's Dwayne Holmes. And uh, I'm a member of the Imperial Courts Housing Projects. And I'm here to say this. Like my brother said earlier, we are the brothers that control our neighborhoods. We the brothers that everybody look up to. They don't look up to y'all, they don't look up to the police because they see they, they feel that the police is a threat to them. You know what I'm saying? So what we say is this, give us something. We help tear down our community, let us help rebuild our communities. Give us funds. Like my man say, put some type of program into, the, into our community where we can help rebuild our community. If we're going to take our brothers off the street, we got to give them something to do. If we're going to stop them from gang banging, if we're going to stop them, if we're going to get them in here like this, then we got to tell them, hey, this is positive. And in positive, if they do something positive, we got to reward them. Let's reward them with jobs. Let's reward them with the education. Let's give them better schools. Hey, we got them here now. Oh, everybody in here, they want this. We got a gang of them that's not here that they want it too. I can speak for my community. We want it. Won't y'all give it to us? Manuel Johnson. Well, I'm Manuel Johnson. I'm here representing Compton for the American program. I'm a member of the Santana Block Crips from the city of Compton. Well, I'm here to say mainly the same thing everybody else has just said. You know, we need help within our communities. You know, y'all look at us as the problem. You ain't seen the problem yet. You got kids growing up looking up to us like everyone else has just said. You know, and by them looking up to us, you know, y'all got a worse problem on your hand. You know what I'm saying? So I see if y'all come to us now and fund us, we can handle the problem. You know, because we got the summer coming up, man, June. You know, and you got these kids going to be out of school. They have nothing to do, nowhere to turn to. The police guard the parks like it's the police station now. You know, we came and kicked in, kick in the park and drank a soda pop without them coming up talking about we drinking beer or where the guns at. You know, this is supposed to be a public park. 
we can't even come kicking no more. You know, we need some funds where we can, you know, do something ourselves. And the only person really helping us now is Jim Brown. Is who? Jim Brown. Jim Brown. Right. You know, he's the only person willing to help us right now. And he needs help from the L.A. City Council, whatever it's supposed to be here, man. Y'all need to help us, man. That's the bottom line. Thank you. Ronald, Ronald Matthews. Ronald Matthews. We've exceeded the time, but we're going to allow you to finish. Thank you. <coughs> That's all right. Hello, I'm from Altadena. I've been in Altadena 22 years, and uh, I'm here to ask the council why we don't have no jobs since we're supposed to have such a serious gang problem. Um, right now, I'm involved in the AmeriCamp program, and it's taught me a lot. I put down the bottle. I don't drink anymore. Um, taking plumbing class, I'm doing real good. I just want to know why we don't have nothing out to dinner. Why? Uh, <laughs> Victor Lagans, Victor Lagans. Hey, I'm gonna speak for Victor Lagans. My name is Marvin Salasi. I'm from the Venice area, and. Enough has already been said about what we want to do, what our intentions are, and I'm going to end it on this note. See, all of us here, as the great Martin Luther King said, he had a dream. We got a dream. We got a dream in this city that Crips and Bloods, children in Crips and Bloods, are going to come together. And we're going to tackle the problems that have kept us down for so long. The problems that it put shackles on us where we, couldn't, where we couldn't express ourselves as true human beings. And then one day we're going to come back here and we're going to say, thank God Almighty, we are free at last, free at last. Uh, the uh, t time has expired. What do you want to say? All I want to say now, you've heard us. We're here. Jim Brown is here. If, if you guys could organize a, a committee or, or your aides or whoever it is that handle that, because we're here and there's no better time than the future, because tomorrow never comes, let's do something now. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, uh, that closes the public comment. Yeah, Mr. President, we are precluded from state law from commenting on uh, anything that is said during public comment, but I, I want to say to the young men that we will ask our community development department to meet with Mr. Brown to see how they may apply for and uh, what possibility of some help they can get with filling in some applications for the funding. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I want to thank you for the orderly manner in which you made your presentation. It was very good. All right, then. We go, uh, before we uh, move on, let's, let's take the 12 vote items that we have before us. Mr. President, you were holding the ordinances on items 61, 4, 5, 6, and 8. Okay. Prepare the roll on those items. Tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Those are approved. Mrs. Flores for an introduction. Yes. Pardon? Can I wait just for a moment? Uh, Mr. President, I think it's, it's appropriate at this time to announce that the famous, well-known, worldwide actor Lou Gossip Academy Award winner, nominee and winner, is here. And uh, he is here with these youngsters. He's also part of the program to, 
to bring them on the right track and get them to stay on the right track. He's going to do a movie about these individuals and uh, how successful the program has been and will continue to be. And let's give him another big hand for what he's doing. Lou, uh, Lou did you want to say something? We're, uh, we're honored to have you in our council chamber. Well, um, you know, it's a prolific problem across this country. And uh, if we're going to infuse our people into the mainstream of the United States, we have to give them a pretty much of a head start. They are proven that they are quite brilliant in what they do. And if we put them on the right track, then we, they can help put this country on the right track. Mr. P Mr. President, I'm... Uh, we'll go back to the uh, item that we had, uh, 31. Mrs. Flores for an introduction. Mr. President, I'm very pleased to introduce to the City Council some visitors we have in Council Chambers this morning. First, I'd like to introduce Anatoly Savin, who is the Director General of the um, Moscow State Control Department for the Preservation of Historic and Cultural Monuments. With him is Anna V. Kasatkina, head of the public relations for that organization. And we have Vladimir I. Sokolovsky, who is the um, deputy director. They are in Los Angeles at the invitation of the Southern California Institute of Architects. And they are I'll, having I'll, discussions I'll, while they're here with Los Angeles-based companies regarding joint ventures for commercial purposes in Moscow. And of course, they're with somebody who knows a great deal about preservation of historical monuments, and that is Georgina Rosenberry from our own Restore. Welcome to Los Angeles. I hope your trip is very successful. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Flores. Uh, members of the council, we voted on item five. Mr. Bernardi wanted to be recorded as a no vote, so there's no objection to reconsideration, and Mr. Bernardi will be recorded as a no vote. Goes over one week. All right, we'll go back to uh, item 31, and we have Mr. Holden would be the first. Uh, yes, Mr. President, I'm really shocked by what Mr. Deaton had to say as relates to uh, item uh, 31 and 31A, uh, and about what the Finance Committee did yesterday. Mr. Deaton, if you don't understand what happened or why it was done legally that way, that's one thing. If you intentionally confuse the facts, I want you to know that I'm really extremely upset about it. And let me point out what the facts are. The facts are that under current law, the Finance Committee has no authority to use directly, that is, CRA monies for essential services, fire and police. And so what they did, they did a paper shuffle where they're saying, Instead of using the money from general funds for the convention and the library, that we can l legally have CRA use its money for that purpose, and then we can take our general fund money and use it as we will. You neglected to even say that. I mean, that's the reason why it was done that way. And I'm very disappointed that you would take your opinion and persuade the members of the council. You also neglected to mention to Mr. Hernandez who repeatedly talks about his district and what his needs for his district. The fact that re redevelopment law does not provide, uh, did not provide until it was changed, an opportunity to have affordable housing outside of the redevelopment area. That law was changed, and we're in the process of changing this law so we can use the money directly for essential services that's generated by the redevelopment area. Now, you also neglect to mention the fact that the law says that you freeze the tax base. Mr. Wu, it is very disappointing that we freeze the tax base and your taxpayers on their property taxes are paying for the essential services that is needed in the redevelopment area and has been. And you've got nothing back for that. And you know that. I don't disagree with anything well, you said. Well, no, you don't disagree. But now we have an opportunity to amend again, once again, the redevelopment law as we did when we were provided for an opportunity for affordable housing outside of the area. We have a chance to amend the law again to provide for essential services that's generated by the area, or we can show that it, it has some association. And you're saying no, and you can't get the bill through. If the president pro tem is going to carry this bill, amend this bill accordingly as we recommend, I bet you it'll go through. You're not there. You've never been there, and you don't understand what it's all about, how it works. But to sit here and say Mr. Bernardi is wrong, and this won't happen, and that won't happen, sitting in that seat, then you're out of line, and I agree with him. 
Give the facts. And you didn't do that. Current law says you cannot use the money directly. They did a paper shuffle yesterday. And you know that. And Mr. Hernandez, this is the only way you're going to get something in your district. <clears throat> and you're going to go along with this? Well, fine, be my guest. But know the consequences of your action. Why are you voting for it? And what you're going to get? Absolutely a zero. Give yourself the local option to do what you want to do with the money. You listen to this guy, you're going to be out in the cold. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wu. Thank you. Mr. President, the important thing for the council to do right now is to take a position. The legislature is waiting to hear from us. The motion, albeit amended, is in front of us. Uh, let's take a position. We'll have plenty of time to debate the issue about CRA money next week and beyond that. So again, uh, I'm calling for a division of the question, and I ask for an I vote on the first part and a no, no vote on the second part. Mr. Uh, Mr. Burnson, I think, is the next one. Mr. Burnson. I just want to say that uh, the motion that I made, the amendment, I'm going to withdraw that for now, and I'll bring that in separately. It, it really is uh, separate uh, from the uh, funding portion of this, and I, and I think, don't think it's appropriate. So I'll withdraw that portion of the, 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 the amendment that I made verbally. Mr. Hernandez. Yes, Mr. President, I just want to point clarification. With the amendment that came in, we have to take a separate vote on whether we accept the entire amendment. The question was divided. You'll uh, vote separately on the two paragraphs on the motion by Councilman Bernardi, and then you'll vote on the committee report as amended. Okay, but we would take a separate vote on the amendment as a whole. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Browdy. Move the previous question on the entire matter. Prepare the roll on the previous question. Tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. That is approved. Now we have, what, what do we have before us? Uh, uh, the question has uh, been, there's been a request to divide the uh, question by Councilman Wu. You'd vote first on the third paragraph of Councilman Bernardi's amending motion 31A. The third motion says to support SB 1330 Roberti and AB 2479 Friedman, if amended, be adopted. That's the third paragraph of 31A, Councilman Bernardi's amending motion. Okay, we have that before us. Prepare the roll. Ask for an aye vote. Tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. That is approved. Now the last paragraph of 31A. Ask for no vote. Right, we just approved that if it's amended, that the city council is on record of supporting it. If it's amended, only if it's amended. I don't know what, uh, that's what you just voted on, support. We divided the question, Mr. Bernardi. We divided the question. So we have the last paragraph in 31A. Yes. Prepare the roll. Prepare the roll. Ask for a no vote. Tabulate the vote. Seven I six no. Uh, that failed. Now we have. Now you have the IGR report as amended. Okay, we have 31 as amended. Prepare the roll. Tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. That is approved. Next item. The next item seven was called special, Mr. Bur Mr. President. Do you want to go back to seven, or do you want to take up the next item after Let's 31? Take up 34. First. 34. 34. The card was submitted on 34. Before we lose some more members here. Well, uh, 34, uh, we, 34 is a matter that's uh, before us, and uh, it's not a public, I guess it is a public hearing. Sam Schiffler, you want to be heard on 34? Thank you, sir. Mr. President and members of the council, this item regards a revision to the booking and, the po and policies of the LA Convention Center. I would like to suggest we should take even a broader look at the entire question of the convention center. Everybody will agree that policing, sanitation, water supply are proper public functions and should be performed by the public authority. But a convention is not a public function. And the convention center has drained huge sums of money away from the city at a time when the city is facing a disastrous financial situation. I think it's time for the members of the City Council to look seriously at the question of getting rid of the Convention Center. 
You can do this by either selling it to private people who want to operate it as a convention center, or failing that, sell it to some of the public agencies who could convert it to a school for the Unified School District or for the, one of the college organizations. Money going to the convention center is not a proper use of public cash. The convention center, sh I suggest, should be discarded and turned over to the private sector. Oh, thank you. That closes the public hearing. Is there any discussion on this item, 34? If not, prepare the roll. Tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. That is approved. Forthwith on that item. Next item. Number seven. Seven. Okay, Mr. Bernardi, item seven, we have some people who want to be heard on this. Thing. I would move the public hearing, Mr. President, and then so we can debate this issue of what? Uh, five. A five minute public five, hearing? Five minutes on each side. Okay, we have. Uh, uh, Peter Elias. Peter Elias. Thank you, Mr. President. Peter Elias, representing the owner and the applicant uh, regarding this zone change request. I've been involved with this request from the very beginning, from when the time the applicant first made his request for 21 units on Sherman Way. And for some of you who don't know what Sherman Way is, it's a major highway that runs through the lower portion of the San Fernando Valley. In this portion, majority of the properties are zoned R3, master plan medium, which is consistent with the R3 zone and developed with apartments and condominiums. Mr. Bibian has been very responsive to the needs of the community. Uh, he's modified his project four times in an effort to try to mitigate all concerns, the planning commission policies, as well as other city criteria. The Planning and Land Use Management Committee report before you, that committee should be commended for the excellent job they did when making a, a recommendation. They took almost four hours and two separate meetings in order to make that proposal. They took into consideration all areas of compatibility as well as consistency. And I strongly urge that you adopt that recommendation. Thank you. So, uh, ben Resnick. Good morning, my name is uh, Ben Resnick of Resnick and Resnick, and I'm the attorney representing the applicant here, Mr. Bibian. Uh, there is no debate, ladies and gentlemen of the council today, as to what the appropriate zoning ought to be. The community plan designates this to be R3, and that's the only zone that can go on. It cannot be more restrictive. The issue here today is one of probably maybe three units. Uh, Fifteen units was approved by your plum committee and I believe that there's a request here to reduce that to 12. Zoning is the means to implement the general plan. It's not a means to amend the general plan. This general plan for Van Nuys says that this should be medium density, which is 24 to 40 units to the gross acre. That would make this property subject to 15 to 25 units under the plan. Originally, my client applied for 21. That was reduced to 19. Then it was reduced to 16 at the Planning Commission. And at the Plum Committee, they reduced it to 15. 14 units plus one house in order to accommodate a compromise that Mr. Bernardi wanted to uh, because of a house across the street. The important thing is you cannot use zoning to, to amend the community plan. It would be inconsistent to approve anything less than what the Plum Committee recommended and in this case, we are agreeable with the Plum Committee's report, which looked at the plans, analyzed the plans, and came up with this particular compromise. It is the lowest number that our client can afford to build on this small little site. Anything less would really make this project, first of all, not legal. It would be less units than what the community plan authorizes. And my position to you, please, is stick to the community plans. My client bought the property under the community plan, believed it entitled him to 21 units. Now he's looking at 15. If you take away any more, you'll be removing more housing from this part of the valley. And so please, we endorse the plum action and uh, we request that you support it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Now Don Schultz is on uh, the other side. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Don Schultz, President of Van Nuys Homeowners Association. Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask your indulgence while I attempt to address some of the most important but inaccurate statements made by the applicant's representative, Mr. Resnick. First of all, at the initial plum hearing, 
Mr. Resnick misstated the total square footage of the subject site as 17,325 square feet. The site is only 16,990 square feet. This figure nets out to 15,090 square feet after the 1,900 square foot dedication on the east side of the subject site for street improvements. Secondly, you will no doubt, um, you've already heard Mr. Resnick argue that the total number of units allocated must be, must be allocated before, after, I'm sorry, let me start this again. <laughs> Mr. Resnick has argued that the number of units allocated must be calculated before the dedication and not after. As Mr. Resnick challenged the Plum Committee and the Planning Department, I challenge him today to show all of us where in Section 12.37G it says that the gross area of a site in a zone change request, that's the key, a zone change request, is used to calculate the number of units to be built. As a matter of record, I submit to you a copy of an interdepartmental correspondence from Frank Orban, a zoning engineer, dated January 7, 1987. And uh, I will submit that as, as evidence if uh, the council would like. I will not read from it right now. In essence, the last, the last statement in that memo, the rationale behind, the rationale behind calculating the remaining square footage is that it only takes place after a zone change. First, furthermore, Mr. Resnick's testimony at both, both Plum Committee hearings consistently referred to Warner Ridge in an attempt to intimidate members of the Plum Committee, the Planning Department, and the City Attorney's Office. The reference to Warner Ridge is nothing more than to coin Mr. Resnick's own phrase, a slippery slope. Every one of us, including Mr. Resnick, knows full well that what the court pointed out in the Warner Ridge decision was that the council's action clearly conflicted with a state law that requires cities to zone land in accordance with their general plans. This is exactly the action that is before you today, no more and no less. Before we go any further, we'd like to point out that there have been a number of serious infractions of the Brown Act with regard to this project. It began with the Planning Commission and was perpetuated with the Plum Committee's two hearings, and it could possibly happen again today with the full City Council. If we all look at the wording, at the agendas of the Planning Commission and the Plum Committee, as they relate to this project, you will find that only a single action was stated on these agendas, and that was, quote, ordinance changing zone from R1-1 and R3-1 to TQ R3-1 for a property located at 14235 Sherman Way, west of Catherine Avenue, unquote. Nowhere was there any mention of a proposed development or project, just a simple zone change request. Council members, I submit that the city has made a serious mistake, which could result in the destruction of a lovely residential street. Now, while our homeowners organization does not make its living suing the city of Los Angeles, like some attorneys in this room do, we will not stand idly by and be bullied into accepting a project that has not been reviewed by the proper city departments, never went through plan check or site plan review, and established a life of its own simply because a single land use attorney was allowed to pontificate about Warner Ridge in his effort to intimidate various elected officials with his threat of still another lawsuit. I can only ask that you make the proper decision today and send this project back to square one where it belongs. Consider the zone change request today, if, if you must, but please do not allow this multi-unit project to ride in on the tail of a zone change simply because the Planning Commission, in their eagerness to facilitate the developer, gave little, if any, thought to the impact this project would have on the neighborhood. Councilman Bernardi has sought to protect the neighborhood by recommending no more than 11 units plus a single family unit to buffer the homes north of this project. While our organization supports the 103 neighbors who signed a petition opposing this project, we feel we can live with Councilman Bernardi's recommendation of 11 units plus a single family, but only if all the proper mitigations are taken to lessen the impact it will have on the neighborhood. In summary, I would like to go back to the previously mentioned violation of the Brown Act. During one of the Plum meetings, Councilman Bernson was told by the Planning Department that site plan review would be the necessary initial step to take for approval of the number of units. This advice was ignored. 
Now we find that the proposed project, which has never received adequate review by any of the appropriate city departments, remains at the forefront of what has always been described in every city agenda as nothing more than a zone change request. Last sentence. Thank you, sir. It should be obvious to everyone at this time that this entire action has been handled very poorly and incorrectly. Please right the ship before this neighborhood is sent adrift without a lifeboat. All right, thank you, Mr. Thank Schultz. you, Mr. President. All right. um, the chair will recognize Mr. Bernardi. First, Mr. President, the members of the council, in the long time I've been here, I've never seen a more grievous mistake made with respect to zoning a community than is in this particular case. And I want you to look at this map. This property, prior to the Assembly Bill 283 uh, role, when we were required to make the plans and the zoning conform, was in the plan of this was for this back half to be R1 and the front half to be RD 1.5. That was what the plan was when this we embarked on the making the plan and the zoning conform. Subsequent to that, this zone change was applied, but somewhere along the line, I want to show you to back up the statement I made about a bad bungle job of planning. If you take a look at this line where the planning and no adequate notice was given to the people, you'll find that there are they have now placed under the R3 zone a very nice single family room and half of the house in the lot next to it. So that convinces me and it's one of the reasons I think it convinced the commission that there were problems with this zoning when it was the commission, unlike Mr. Resnick, not Mr. Bernardi, who decided that there ought to be one detached home because of the plan that was unfortunately adopted, changing that to R3, that there ought to be one a, a detached home so that it would conform with the subdivision and the property and the property that, that, we, that we have, that we're dealing with right now. Now, first, where's Claudia? There she, where's Claudia? She's not here right now. Do you want me to call her back down, Mr. Bernardi? Uh, yes, because the question has been raised about not conforming with the plan. Now, you know, Mr. Resnick is a kind of an able attorney who represents, uh, who represents quite a few, few, clients, few clients. He says okay. if you go down to 12, it's violation. We're violating the plan amendment. But if that were the case, then he's not representing his clients because he should have insisted on 21 units because the plan has flexibility and the planners have figured out what the minimum we can give them we can also go down to was it 11.6 or even 10 for that matter pardon for the record i'm bob rogers with the you, planning you department ahead, you, you can go down to how many to 10 to as, as little as 10 and still be found in conformance so we're, we think that we're compromising here. I would have, I would, and we debated for a long time with planning with the attorney and in my staff at maybe rolling this back, this R1, because I want to make this point, and it's important. When the Assembly Bill 3, 283 modifications were embarked on, this property and the plan were both R1, and there is no indication in the court order that R1 properties that are in conformance were to be upzoned. But in essence, that's what the error did. They admit the error, and it would have been nice. I would have loved to roll it back, but it was decided that we were in the situation we were in. The best we could do is grant the minimum number of units and go along with the commission, commission's requirement for, for um, one single family or one detached unit. Uh, again, I want to make that point. Mr. Resnick knows full well that uh, there is a range in the medium, and it goes from, in this case, it would go from 10 all the way up to 21, and we're recommending 12. Next door, here's your plot. Next door, same size lot. It has 10 units on it that this council approved. 10 units on the lot next to it. Across the street is another smaller lot, has six units on it. 
And that's why the only way I can see at this time to correct this grievous error is to the limit the, the, R, the portion that is now zoned R1. Now zoned R1, but we're, we're not going to question the R3, by, but by limiting this whole development to 12 units, 11 apartments, and one single single family, single family detached. And another item, there's no parking on the side for very good reasons because of the traffic and the problems created by all these apartments parking right along all the way up the street. We're trying to prevent that. So one of the conditions, of course, that we want imposed will be that there be no tandem parking. There's no tandem parking next door. They have a subterranean garage that provides two and a half spaces. And that gets the cars off the street because Sherman Way here also is, 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 um, is uh, there's no parking provided in, in, that, in that area. So all that I'm asking for is that we give them, it's even a little more than legally the minimum requires, is that we allow them 12 units, that one unit be a separate unit, single family unit, and that there be no tandem parking. No tandem parking has been a policy that I've used in my district, in the old as well as the new district, for years. Because what you get then are people won't park in their garages or in the parking that's provided and spew right into the residential area. So that's what we're asking for here. We're not opposing the R3. I'd love to oppose it, but it's here with us. So now we're asking, and the city attorney will tell you, as planning told thank, you, thank you Mr. that Bernardi. we're within legal grounds with the 12. Thank, thank you. I gave you six minutes, Mr. Bernardi. Mr. Bernson, the chair. Of, thank, thank you. I gave you six minutes, Mr. Bernardi. Mr. Bernson, the chair of the committee. Mr. President, members of the council, it has long been uh, the policy of uh, the chair of the Plum Committee, and I think the member of the Plum Committee to do their best to support council members uh, in their own district. Uh, however, uh, we have had recent problems uh, in some cases in doing that, uh, and Warner Ridge was alluded to, that's one, but there have been a number of other problems. Uh, I have been instructed by the president of the council to, uh, to treat each case uh, as we think it appropriately should be. And in fact, uh, twice since Mr. Ferraro said that, we've gone against his wishes in his district. So um, uh, we're not just picking on Ernie. Uh, the problem here is that the piece of property in question is in two sections. Uh, there are actually two parcels. The front portion is already zoned R3. And the applicant could have built 10 units by right on this property without any type of um, uh, attempt to come in for a, uh, a zone change or anything else as long as they were apartments if, uh, if he did not want a, uh, uh, a uh, subdivision. The uh, back portion, while it is uh, not currently zoned R3, under the community plan is designated also as R3 property. What Mr. Bernardi attempted to do was to try to protect some single family homes which face the back portion of the property. And uh, part of the deliberations uh, of, the, um, of the committee was to also uh, adhere to that, uh, to that uh, attempt. In fact, the uh, developer did agree to have one unit that would be separate from the uh, uh, other building, and that would face the property directly across the street, which is single family, even though it is also in an R3 community planned area. And I understand Mr. Bernardi has uh, in initiated uh, an attempt to uh, to roll that back on that property, and that that's appropriate at this time because there's no application on the property across the street. Uh, so what we did is we uh, we uh, crafted a compromise, and I believe it was what uh, 15 units was it, uh, Mr. Rogers? Um, the back portion of the property, uh, technically, uh, had he come in for a uh, amendment uh, for a for a uh, zone change on the back portion could have gotten 10 units and could have built 20 units on the entire property. Uh, we felt this was a good compromise, the committee. We felt it would keep the uh, council and the city out of trouble. And we also felt it uh, recognized the need that Mr. Bernard, Mr. Bernardi and the community expressed for having the single family unit um, facing the uh, single family uh, home across the street. 
So uh, you can do as you wish. Uh, I'm not going to get upset if you don't go with the committee, if you want to support Mr. Bernardi. But I do feel that the committee has expressed what we feel is in the best interest of the city and uh, in the best interest of appropriate land use. So the decision is up to uh, the council. And uh, I merely, uh, I will support the, uh, the Plum report because I feel that it's the appropriate way to go. But uh, you'll have to make your own decision on whether you want to go with Mr. Bernardi or not. All right, thank you. Mr. Hernandez. I just, uh, we've heard two versions of a story here, and I, I want to support the, Mr. Bernard, I want to support the Plum Committee, but the Planning Commission also had a recommendation here, and their recommendation was to adopt the findings. Um, I just, uh, there was a legal question that was brought out. What's your perception of that legal question? And as well as, can you give me some insight as to why your findings are standing right now? The uh, Planning Commission essentially recommended the same density that the uh, committee has recommended. As to whether or not there is a Warner Ridge implication, um, we do not feel there is. We are buttressed by that by advice from the city attorney. The uh, situation we have here is that both the density that has been proposed by Mr. Bernardi and the density proposed by the Commission and the Plum Committee both are well within the legal requirements under Warner Ridge. That is to say that both options grant a density that is um, considerably above the density that would be afforded by the RD 1.5 zone, a zoning which if the city had limited this property to RD 1.5 to a RD 1.5 zone could have had a Warner Ridge problem. Okay, um, yeah. okay. I just want, I also want to know uh, the additional three units, which I think is oh, yeah. the, the difference here we're talking about, uh, that would make uh, basically some of that housing a little bit more affordable. Would that would it reduce the cost price? And I also want to know what impact it would have on the surrounding neighborhood. I know that. It certainly would um, influence the economies of scale as to the affordability of the project. Uh, there is some good, there are contentions made, there are very valid contentions about the possible intrusion into the single family residential neighborhood that lies primarily to the north that perhaps this ought to be a lesser density. The Planning Commission, at least, in looking at this, took into consideration the project that would be possible had the developer merely come in for a zone change on the rear portion of his property, and if the city had given him a minimum density on that property, it would appear that still a 14 or 15 unit project would have been possible. Okay, I just want to, because my time's up, uh, but you still stand by your findings? That's correct. Mr. Browdy. Um, Mr. Rogers, the motion that Mr. Bernardi has on the floor, is that legal? Absolutely, yes. There's no question about that? No question about it. Okay, I'll ask the city attorney. Yes, is, will you approve it as to form yes. and legality as complying with all city laws? Yes. Yes. Well, Mr. President, I share Mr. Bernardi's uh, chagrin at uh, the allegations that somehow this is illegal and there's a threat of a lawsuit. I think that we have a responsibility to uh, plan the city on the basis of merit and not on the basis of Threat, alleged uh, threats, uh, and that's the basis upon which it should be done. You've heard very forceful advocacy from the council person of the district, Mr. Bernardi. You've heard very forceful comment from the members of the community. Uh, I think that we should support Mr. Bernardi and, mo and that his proposed solution is reasonable and it's fair and it protects the community. And I ask for an aye vote on Mr. Bernardi's motion. Uh, Mr. Holden? Yeah, uh, Mr. Bernson, uh, when this matter was before us, I was under the impression that uh, this is something that we had to take or we would, there would be a pending lawsuits. But what I'm hearing now is that 
what Mr. Bernard is offering is, offering is still within the legal parameters of the Warner Ranch lawsuit and is still in excess of what they would ordinarily be entitled to under the present zoning. Is that correct? So Mr. Bernard is giving them more than they're entitled to. So he's making, he's, that's, that too is a compromise, compromise on upside. Uh, and then it, he's his district, and if he's giving them more than they're rightfully entitled to, I was not aware of that. Uh, I, I'm like you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I tend to want to go along with the person in that district. Uh, somewhere along the line, and it's not your fault, that somebody uh, did not advise at each, each member of the committee as to what the facts are. Uh, I, I'm, I'm inclined to support uh, uh, Mr. Browdy concept uh, as relates to the Bernardi Amendment. Uh, given the, the new light shown on the subject matter, because this is something that I didn't know, know about. Mr. Uh, so uh, my time's up, Mr. President. Yeah. Maybe I talk too slowly. Use that talk fast. Yeah, you, you have, it was so interesting that time went so fast. All right, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bernardi. I just want to get clarified with the city attorney here on the uh, uh, what we had recommended to the Plum Committee and the wording so that we be sure we have it all, all covered under the amendment that I am making to the committee report. Yeah, well, th there should also be language indicating that this zone change is not intended as an approval of the waiver of the yard area setback requirements. And, it, and also would include no tandem parking in the, in the, um, in the approval of this proposal. Again, I want to, I want to indicate, you talk about the, uh, the, the lot next door, same size as 10 units, lot across the street is smaller, has six units. But I think the real serious problem is there has been an unfortunate error. The planning department now admits it, and we talk about lawsuits. We've been trying to find out if the owners adjacent to the property, right adjacent to it, where the R1 was established to protect that single family home, whether they were notified. And strangely enough, we can't find the original file and we can't get the names of the people who were notified. That's what we've been trying to do for some time. And if somebody mentions a lawsuit, it could be, it could be just, just, just in, the, in, in the reverse. But I'm asking that we're going to give them the R3. Giving them 12 units is two more than the same size lot next door has. And I think that that's, that's a reasonable compromise as to what was um, originally, originally intended. But even from my standpoint, it, we'd have been better off with the R3 in the front and remaining the R1 retaining. We now have the R3 to deal with, and I'm urging and asking for an I vote on the amendment that I proposed to the Plum Committee report. And I just want to point out again, the reason the Planning Commission put that single family home in there, be because it recognized that there was an unfortunate error made when the lines were drawn that drew a line right in the middle of one single family home and included another nice single family home. They're now in the R3 and to protect the neighborhood. We're in the process, as Mr. Bernson pointed out, and this committee sent it to the planning committee for some action. So I'm asking for an I vote. Uh, Mr. Uh, Bernson. Let me just uh, state that the committee did not uh, react to the threats of a lawsuit. The committee um, is not afraid of a lawsuit when we think we're on solid ground. Uh, I might point out that there's also a question of equity when people's property rights are concerned. Uh, the owner of the property, if, if it were my client, I would have advised him uh, to withdraw his application and build 10 apartment units on the front half of the property and then go in for his own change on the back half. And uh, we would be hard pressed to deny that, incidentally. So uh, this was a question of avoiding, this, was, this is not a, uh, a, a highly sophisticated wealthy developer, it's a uh, it's a uh, small entrepreneur who uh, is not sophisticated in land use, and we thought this was a fair and equitable issue that would uh, uh, solve the problems and also prevent any possible uh, legal problems, because there are, le there are some legal ramifications in spite of what the uh, planning, direct, uh, planning representative, uh, Mr. Rogers, may surmise. 
you know, we get advice from our, uh, from our various uh, uh, city attorneys and so forth, but they're not always uh, correct advice. Not that they don't mean well and think that it's correct. I'm sure that the attorneys who gave us advice on Porter Ridge thought they were giving us appropriate advice at the time, but it doesn't always work out that way. So, as I said, I have no great uh, desire to overrule Mr. Mr. Bernardi, and if uh, council feels they wish to support him, uh, uh, by all means go ahead. But I, I'm merely stating um, what I think is a fair and equitable and safe uh, recommendation, and that's what the committee is presenting. So uh, let your conscience be your guide. And, uh, but I must tell you that we were not uh, responding because we were threatened with Warner Ridge. There is a question of consistency in what the community plan means. And one of our problems we have as a community is we don't respect the community plan. And that's why the state had to initiate legislation against us in AB 283. And that's why we are sued continually on various uh, land use issues because we don't adhere to the community plan. And uh, merely uh, the committee report merely reflects uh, uh, respect to the community plan and the advice of the president of the council to try to do what he thought was appropriate. So if you wish to support Mr. Bernardi, I'm certainly not going to uh, uh, jump to the high heavens about it, because, but I do feel it was the duty, my duty as chair of the committee and the committee to at least express the view that we thought was appropriate. Uh, Mrs. Flores. Yes, Mr. Rogers, can you tell us how you got to 10 units? Excuse me, uh, the, the 10 units that would be allowed on the front portion of the property, uh, that would be after land to be dedicated for the widening of Catherine Avenue. And we arrived at 10 simply by the maximum that would be possible under the R3 zone. Understanding that because there already is R3 zoning on the south half or the front half of the property, that they would be uh, able to walk into City Hall today and pull a building permit from the Department of Building and Safety for at least 10 units on the southern half of their property. Uh, no site plan review, no discretionary actions involved. I think what Mr. Uh, Bernson was alluding to, that in addition to that, they could also file for a zone change just on the rear half of the property. And to be consistent with the plan, they could expect a minimum of five or six additional units on the back portion of the property. So we're talking uh, about 15 units that would be possible on this property if they withdrew this application, for example, and came back in for a zone change just on the rear portion of the property. Okay, but it's, it's, it's R3 now, which would allow 10. Now, when you uh, ask a, a property owner to dedicate property, you, you deduct that from the amount of land they have? If it involves a discretionary action such as a zone change, yes, we deduct that and we deduct, deduct it from the amount of area that can be used to calculate the density on a property. That's correct. But if it's not, um, if, okay, if, if it's not discretionary, what if, what if they, somebody owns some property, I know this is not in this case, but if somebody owns some property and we ask them to dedicate for highway widening or whatever, then does that, and they do it, does that um, reduce the, could that reduce the number of it units? It could reduce could the number, that's correct, and uh, you could utilize that portion that was within, within the zone permitting apartments to be calculated in determining the number of units that would be possible on that portion of the property, that's correct. Mr. Hernandez? You know, Mr. Rogers, uh, I recognize I'm kind of new and I'm learning a lot of these processes and from my perspective I'm really trying to look at your department for some leadership uh, and I understand some of the pressure you might have to face in dealing with different council offices and on this one I have a report from a plum committee I have a report from from the Commission and I guess staff that is telling me that this project that is being proposed is consistent I also know that one of the things we're looking at is a zone change and what I'm hearing right now is that what Mr. Bernardi is proposing would not uh, basically face any legal ramifications for us and we as a council have had to deal with legal ramifications on land use decisions. If that zone change was not to happen, I'm hearing that uh, basically he's entitled to build 10 units just on one part of the property. Mm -hmm. And then I'm hearing that legally he could come in and build additional units if he was granted a zone change. And I want to know, can we deny that potential zone change he would apply for for the back part of the lot? There's some question as to whether you could 
deny or sharply limit the zoning on the rear portion of the property in light of Warner Ridge. Right. Uh, but Warner Ridge aside, yes, this council would has the right to turn down any application. Uh, I think it's worthy to point out because I'm here not only representing the, or the commission's point of view, but it was also the staff's point of view that there should be at least 14 units on the property. And something that hasn't been mentioned in the discourse today is that we recommended it on the basis that despite the fact that there was a lower density apartment immediately to the west, that predominantly along Sherman Way, both on the north side and the south side of Sherman Way, we're talking about an R3 density for predominantly for those developments along the street. Okay. So that right now there is a potential, some legal liability, uh, if, the, for example, we were to leave it as is and the developer was to continue in the very course of withdrawing this application starting all over again. There's a, perhaps there's a potential liability. I'll leave that to the city attorney. But mm -hmm. uh, So right now part of making Mr. Bernardi's proposal uh, an acceptable proposal and not facing any legal liabilities would also be the zone change that's being proposed before us? The, what, we're, what we're suggesting to you that uh, on the advice of the city attorney and our own opinion is that a 12 unit project, in other words 11 multiple, single, 11 multiple units and one single family unit would be a density that would well exceed that afforded by the RD 1.5 zone. And I mentioned the RD 1.5 zone because it's the most restrictive zone or the next most restrictive zone. And if the council were to approve RD 1.5, then I think, and I think the city attorney would agree, there's a Warner Ridge type problem. Right, so, but he could build 10 units on one part of the property if he was to withdraw this application. I'm That's just right. trying to, I want to understand. Yes. Uh, Mr. Bernardi? I don't know if I'm going to get the point across to Mr. Hernandez. If he had come in and applied for a permit just for the front, Mr. Hernandez, then's when we found out what happened in the air, where all of that, instead of the back remaining as it was previously, R1 on the master plan and R1 on zoning, immediately there would have been an application to change that. So, and we would have been in our legal right, because there was no action taken, being taken with respect to the back part. So um, it would have been a blessing to the community if they had just come in and gotten their permit for 10. And then we could have blocked the back half and retained it. And they would have had 11 units, not 12 units. So I'm asking for the um, amendment, and that is to permit 11 uh, units plus one single family home to, to conform with the, the general pattern in that particular area. All right, um, that's all. Look, we have the matter before us now. Would you start with the amendments? Uh? Councilman Bernardi has made two separate verbal amendments. The first would affect Q condition number 14, that tandem parking shall not be permitted. And two, the density, it would um, change the condition number 18, Q condition number 18, that would allow only 11 townhouse units and one single family detached unit. And he's added at the advice of the city attorney a separate Q condition, which would be 20, that the zone change not be intended to include approval of any waiver of setback requirements. Now you have that amendment okay, before let's, you. Uh, let's, vote a, let's vote on the first one first, the tandem parking. Prepare the roll on that. Tabulate the vote. 10 ayes, 3 no. That is approved. Now we have... Uh, the additional uh, Q condition. This is on, uh, not intended to include approval of any waiver of setback requirements. Okay, prepare the roll on that. Tabulate the vote. Nine ayes, four no. Now what do we have? Now you have the committee report before you as amended. There was one more motion. That was the oh, one. Oh, I, I included the, the 14 you and 18 together. You don't want to do no, that No, I, I voted yes okay. on, the, on the waiver of setbacks and so forth. All right, then the units would be next. No more than 11 uh, townhouse units and one single family detached unit. Okay, prepare the roll on that. Now, hold on a second. Tabulate the vote. Eight ayes, five no. Now that is approved. Now the committee report as amended. Prepare the roll on the committee report as amended. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes, 2 no. Um, being as this was a disapproved by the commission, 
uh, requires 10 votes uh, to, and therefore this is not approved. Uh, the yes. ordinance is now on the desk. Uh, it would have to be withheld so the commission could sign off on it. The ordinance I have on the file says the uh, director signed off as an approval Hello. of the ordinance. There's an approval here, but the action taken by the council based on the most recent motion would be contrary to what the commission approved. Um, and the ordinance being sent back to the commission yep. for approval could very likely be disapproved, and that would cause yeah. this to be a 10 vote item. Yeah. I'm, I'm speculating that's true. So the ordinance would be referred back to the commission to sign off on the ordinance before it comes that's back correct. to council. Next point of order. Uh, what was the last vote when the... 11 to 2. Committee report the committee as amended, 11 to 2. Well, doesn't... But it still has to go back to the commission because it's different in the... Okay. All right. But it was 11 to 2, the vote. Yeah. We don't have All the right. ordinance before All right, us. But the, uh, the commission should be informed that the committee report was approved by Point 11 of members of the council. Point of order. The substantive right. changes in the ordinance were not approved by, a which was the number of units, were not approved by a sufficient number. So therefore, it does significantly alter the action of the commission. Point, point of order, once an amendment is made, the final vote incorporates all the amendments. An 11 to 2 is an 11 to 2 vote on everything. Yes, but the problem is that the ordinance is on the desk. The ordinance itself does not have those True, changes. and when it comes back, it yeah. will need 10 votes, 8 or, or 10, depending. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. The next item. 36. Item uh, 16 has been held until Ridley Thomas arrived. Mr. Mr. Ridley Thomas, item 16 we held for you. Hello. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. This is a matter that uh, came before us some weeks ago regarding uh, administrative savings in terms of the um, grant process. The members of staff um, who are here, who I'm going to ask to come and give us a fuller explanation of this uh, so that we can dispose of this matter in the appropriate way. Uh, Ms. Clark from the department, uh, I suspect there should be representation from the CAO. Proceed, Ms. Clark. Okay. Uh, motion 1B instructed um, CDD to utilize administrative savings to fund those programs that had high scores. There is a limit of 15% on how much funds can be expended out of the Community Development Block Grant for public services. Currently, there is room on the CDBG public services cap to expend funds through June 30th of 92. After that point, we will be exceeding the public services cap. The three programs that scored high, there was one program scoring 93, 195, and 196. Two of those programs are citywide, one of which has no sites available at this time. One of the programs is an immigration program where there were two programs already scoring higher than, than that one, totaling about 200,000 annually that has been provided. And one additional citywide program provides technical assistance to other programs that are in the delivery system. Our options at this point would be to fund programs for a three month period. At this point, there are only two months remaining in that period. The other option would be to exceed the public services cap. The department's recommendation is that we not fund programs for the remaining two months and that these programs that were reviewed in the proposal review process were recommended and proposed to provide services on an annual basis so they are not one-time expenditures that could be provided for during this short period. We have recommended, however, that we work together with the CLA's office to raise the administrative cap, and I understand that a motion has been introduced by Councilman Hernandez to accomplish that. 
Mr. Uh, Ridley Thomas, did you want to be heard on this item? We held it for you, so I'm going to let you have the first opportunity to speak. Um, uh, Mr. President, the, the concern is one of merit as it was raised by the maker of the motion. Uh, as it is um, before us, um, uh, reported by the department and substantiated, as I understand it, by the CAO, this is simply impractical. Uh, and toward that end, it seems to me that this motion um, this action would be appropriately uh, received uh, and filed. Um, and if there's another way to accomplish what the makers of the motion had in mind, it would seem to me that that ought to be considered when uh, such an item is presented uh, to us. All right, Mr. Hernandez? Yes, Mr. President, members of council, I think we go back to February on this item. Uh, but the motion was made on February 4th. And uh, I'm glad I made the motion because uh, I'm not sure if any of us were aware that uh, there's over, I guess, a million nine hundred thousand dollars that was basically about the administrative savings on the item. I tend to agree with staff that starting in May it'd be difficult to spend that money. And again, the motion was made in February, and if I could take us all back to that date prior to that in January when we were dealing with all these agencies who needed funding. Uh, that was part of why the motion was being made. Uh, I think that this money is just too precious. I think it's just too necessary for those agencies doing the work for this to be happening. And administrative cost savings, it's been an area where, again, we've had those savings year after year after year. My understanding, I just would like staff to please confirm that next year we'll be able to use this money to fund those organizations, uh, and that's important. Uh, I also think it was important that we support that, that change of the 15% cap. Uh, sometimes I think our administrative costs are higher than 15%. Uh, right now, I continue to look at the committee's work and I, I appreciate the work that's being done. I think uh, uh, the agencies right now are just needing every penny they can get, but it doesn't make sense to waste it and I will follow the committee's recommendation on this item. Anyone else want to be heard? Okay. Well there's a motion to receive and file. There's no objections. That'll be the order. Thank you, Mr. President. Next, next item. Item 36 called special. Okay, we call that special because we have Howard Watts that wants to be heard. Howard Watt. Thank you. Um, of, welcome order, back, Mr. sir. Point of order, Mr. President. Uh, I wonder if the appropriate. Pardon me, Mr. Watts. I wonder if the appropriate action would not be to rescind uh, the motion as it was approved uh, rather than receiving and filing the uh, committee report as such. Uh, that probably would be what would be required uh, so that we can make sure this is uh, done in the appropriate way. So, Madam Clerk. So you want to rescind the Hernandez motion that was previously adopted? Well, yes. All right. Uh, then you'll have to change your motion. It's so changed. Okay. Well. Okay, then changing the motion, Mr. President. Well, we're not, um, the, the motion was already acted upon, um, and we're not reacting to a, a committee report to receive and file the action. No. We need to rescind uh, the motion that was approved by council since we've now learned that it's impractical, practically impossible to do it. Okay. All right. So, so nothing happens then. That's right. No, this okay, needs to there's the matter is before us, and, uh, uh, we have uh, Mr. Ridley Thomas's motion. Prepare the roll. Tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. That's approved. What? No, we rescinded it. It was a receive and file. Now we have, now we have Mr. Watt wants to be heard on item number thirty-six. Okay, and I'll continue after I got disrupted. Um, I happen to be working with the rent stabilization uh, group here in Los Angeles and against a homeowner that our property owner who is uh, a, what we call slumlord owner. That rent stabilization program in LA has helped the tenants, has not hurt the tenants at one iota. But this bill, AB 3007 Johnson, would pretty much knock rent stabilization programs out unless a study is uh, conducted to demonstrate existence of specified housing conditions and would require a local agency to reevaluate its program no less than once every three years. 
Uh, this is just uh, a menace, as, as I call it, all this stuff that uh, is in this uh, bill. And I think we need to kill a bill and forget about it so that we will have rent stabilization in the city of Los Angeles and under any other place where they have rent control. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we have item number 36 before us. Uh, Mr. Bernardi recommends, the committee recommends oppose uh, Johnson's bill. Any discussion on that? If not, prepare the roll. Tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. That is approved. Item 40. Item 40, we have uh, Mr. Schiffler wants to be heard on item 40. This item before you now involves a Senate bill which would require the disclosure of off-the-record communications between the public and members of the governing board of the SCAQM district. In general, of course, I think we should favor open government as much as possible, aside from legal actions or items of that kind which are necessarily secret. And therefore, I disagree, and I recommend that you reject this opposition to the Senate bill. I believe that in the public interest, it would be better for maximum op uh, uh, freedom of discussion and maximum opening. And therefore, I urge you to reject the recommendation that the Senate Bill 1328 be opposed. She's, she's my keeper. Okay. okay. Item number 40. Is there anyone who wants to be heard on that? The public hearing is closed. Mr. Bernardi? Explanation from the legislative enamels. It does not. It does not take away the um, information that, that the public's entitled to any of it. Yes, that's correct, Mr. Bernardi. I'm Michael Karsh with the Legislative Analyst Office. Current law requires that there be adequate disclosure made by a public official at the AQMD on which is the basis for his or her vote. In other words, if you are listening to testimony before you, then obviously everyone knows that's what you're basing your decision on. But if you have, prior to that meeting, had contact with other interested parties, you are supposed to disclose that. That is current law. What this bill would do, it's directed solely at the South Coast Air Quality Management District and orders them to develop a more detailed policy on ex parte communication disclosures. There are several concerns to doing this. Number one, existing law already requires disclosure. Number two, it does not cover dis uh, contacts that are made off the record with the staff of the AQMD. It is frequently the staff of the AQMD in preparing their reports for the members of the board who have the greatest influence anyway, and there is no requirement of disclosure on who they have seen or from whom they have heard prior to making their report. Number two, it would stifle the oral communications made by a constituent to a member of that board, if that member is a, an elected official. All oral communications must be disclosed by the person who does the contact, not the, not the official on the AQMD who is hearing it. Therefore, he must tell that constituent, wait, before you go any longer, you have got to make a disclosure to the AQMD clerk that you are having this communication with me. This will have, we feel, the effect, the negative effect of discouraging and chilling communication by constituents with the members of the AQMD. And lastly, we think that this is a very difficult area to enforce. How are you going to determine who initiated the contact? Therefore, who bears the burden of disclosing that a contact was made? We believe that the existing law is sufficient, and therefore that the, uh, that the Rosenthal measure in Sacramento should be opposed. We also think that the AQMD should not be under pressure to adopt an ex parte communication policy by this state legislation, and that they should hold off until we can dispose of the Rosenthal bill. Mr. Bernardi moves approval. Are there any discussion? If not, prepare the roll on item 40. Tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. That is approved. Next item. Item 41, call special. 
Uh, who called 41 special? It Councilman Burnson has 41A on the desk. Mr. Burnson, 41A. Uh, Mr. President, I believe uh, Mr. Gridley Thomas uh, wants to continue this matter, and uh, I have no objection. One week, Mr. President. One week. There's no objection. Uh, with your permission. Is one week acceptable? Yeah. Whatever you say. With the amendment. Whatever I say? Yeah. I want that to be noted. <laughs> Next item. Items 49 and 50 are closed session no. matters. Okay, we have some exec we have an executive session on two items. Would everybody leave the three items? Would everybody leave the council chamber who's not involved with the executive session? Hey, I'm public had, comment was already provided. We had the public comment, you know it, Mr. Hollis. Hey. All right, item, uh, item 50 will be continued for one day. And now we have to uh, take action on the, For, uh, 49A. the president signing the uh, letter. Would you open the roll on the uh, authorization to sign the letter? This is the letter that goes to the lieutenant governor of the state of California in connection with 49A on today's agenda. It was the first close we had. Open the roll. I close the roll. Ten aye. And that was approved. You also have excuses on the desk, Mr. President. Councilwoman Flores has a request to be excused. City business uh, tomorrow at 11.20 a.m. That'll leave council with ten members. A motion is required. <laughs> is there any uh, objection? Uh, Mrs. Pikus moves and Mr. Wax seconds. Open the roll. I do. Close the roll. Ten aye. That was approved. Councilman Alatori had requested to be excused from today's meeting due to city business. Unanimous vote. Council policy. And Councilwoman Pikus has requested to be excused Wednesday, May 13th, to leave uh, and also to leave early at 11.30 on May 12th. Both dates meet council policy on city business. Without objection, unanimous vote. Motions for posting and referral. So ordered. That clears the desk, Mr. President. Uh, we now have adjourning motions. Would the audience please rise? Mr. Bernardi. Jerry Pelletier is a Silmar resident and a longtime member and active worker, particularly in the Silmar Independent Baseball League. And he's survived by his wife, two daughters, and two sons, and also a longtime friend of mine, uh, Mildred McDonald, who is the wife of Al McDonald, who was one of the people deeply involved many years ago in uh, John F. Kennedy's activity, activities in getting the be the nominee for the President of the United States. He served the family long before that and has served since. And this is his wife. It's a person, a very nice lady who, have, who passed away. Mr. Burnson. Yes, I'd ask that we adjourn in memory of Frederick Daniel Lonis, who's the father of Becky Levesque, uh, uh, head of a, the Protect organization in my district, also survived by his wife, Janet, and three other daughters and two sons. I'll second that. Also, I'd like to ask that we adjourn in memory of Margaret Romaine Arnold Dorn, the mother of Warren Dorn. Oh, second. Yeah, she was 95 years old and resided in a retirement home near Lake Arrowhead. She survived by her children, among which our, our former supervisor, Warren Dorn. Would you want to put all members on that one? <clears throat> Ms. Pikus. Yeah ask that we uh, adjourn in memory of Sharon Good, who was an um, entrepreneurial CEO of Prestige Leather Creations, died much too young at 47. Mr. Wax. Yes, I'd like the council to adjourn in memory of uh, two of my relatives, uh, my uncle Irving Wax, who passed suddenly this weekend and was really uh, someone who was uh, loved by just about everyone who ever knew him, and deeply involved in a lot of activities in the, in the valley, it leaves a, a, a long 
fabulous family, a close family, uh, and um, a lot of friends, uh, especially in the golfing community. All uh, members. And many others. Um, and uh, my Aunt Dolly is probably known by many of you and uh, many of her children and grandchildren. And uh, it's quite a moving service this morning. And uh, my cousin Rose Dollar, uh, from Silver Springs, Maryland, whose husband had a very long and distinguished career in the U.S. Department of Labor, uh, and I'll give the clerk the pertinent information on both of those. Call the roll. Her husband, I have an announcement, if I may. Uh, the Planning and Land Use Management Committee will meet in 15 minutes in this room. Okay, Mr. Ridley Thomas. Uh, just the announcement that the matter uh, involving ADEPT is continued to May 8th um, would be uh, worth everyone knowing. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay. Yes. Proceed with the roll, ma'am. I just did. Council is adjourned.